Welcome to the February room. Do your spring break plans include a welcoming beach somewhere in the Bahamas, Florida, or Mexico? Then you're going to want to tune in to this episode as host Justin Carnop investigates a disturbing trend in the rise of a seaweed known as sargasm. Daybreak in Quintana Roo, Mexico. It's the first morning of a vacation with my wife and our new baby, my sister and her family. I've tiptoed out of the rented palapa, forsaken a cup of coffee, the stoke of the prospect of flats fishing enough to spur me from slumber. Leaning against the palm tree, I don wading boots, pluck a crab pattern from my box, secure it to my leader, then head for the inviting little bay visible from our patio. Pretty damn juicy piece of camp water, I think, as I near the water's edge. My focus is singular, game eyes trained on the glassy bay. I hadn't seen a permit in years, but immediately I recognized my old foe. Less than a football field away, sickle tails shimmer before a horizon engulfed in golden light. I compose myself best I can, and with the hook pinched between my thumb and index finger, wade into the tepid Caribbean. Shuffling my feet carefully while stripping a loop of line, I organize my program to toss the fly pick it up and deliver it to a target in three fluid motions smoothed into one. But I'm rusty and I fumble, entangling my line around my boot. Clearly, the current is easing the other direction and I adjust the slack line accordingly while not losing sight of the school of feeding permit. The fish seem oblivious as I ease into position for a 60 foot cast, the 35 yard field goal of the flats game. There's but a breath of wind and I flick the crab off my right shoulder lift the rod, guesstimate the distance, and place the fly right in the middle of a permit isosceles. A good effort, as the golfers say. All three fish tip up on the fly and I ease the slack out of the line until I feel resistance, strip set, and hang on. The surface boils with the pandemonium of permit panic. Holy crap, did I really just hook a permit on my initial cast? Solo on a flat I've never seen before? Lauren is never gonna believe this. After the initial surprise and a mad dash from the hooked fish, I gain control and turn it. Too easy. The sum of the weight of resistance doesn't add up to a permit. I come back to earth. I'm not a permit fisherman after all. Disappointment replaces elation and I reel in a mangrove snapper. The thief had pulled off quite a heist, snuck in the back door and cock blocked me. Then I take measure of where I am, the experience I just had, am having. I'm standing alone on a flat immersed in a spectacular sunrise holding an exotic fish that I caught on a fly of my own design. A fish, matter of factly, that happens to be quite edible. I bonk the snapper with my folded Leatherman tool, not out of spite, but because mangrove snapper are delicious and our palapa came armed with an outdoor grill. The flat is seemingly devoid of fish life now, the entire school of permit having fled for the sanctuary of deeper water. So I desert it too, drop the snapper in the cooler back at camp, then stroll down the beach to see what else the morning might bring. Off in the distance, I see men hauling carts out to the shoreline. I assume these must be local fishermen. Perhaps they're gathering crabs or foraging some of their delicacy of the Caribbean beach. Curious, I quicken my pace. The smell hits me first. The inviting waft of ocean breeze I'd come from Montana to take in deteriorates into a stank akin to garbage abandoned beneath a heat lamp. Bigfoot's perennium. The men pull rakes from their carts and begin rounding up the source of the stench, a brownish aquatic plant material. I assume it's some sort of seaweed, and I'm mystified as to why it's washing ashore in such quantities, but I know better than to try my pitiful Spanish on such a complex query. I realize then that the workday has begun in Mexico, and figure I'd better get back to the palapa. The baby's probably up and mom could use a hand. I could use some coffee. Besides, I have a fish to clean and a couple of stories to tell. We had an amazing trip to the Riviera Maya, the coastal region between Cancun and Belize in the Mexican state of Quintana Roo. We swam in cenotes and lived simply, my fly rod in the bay in front of our digs providing the majority of the protein to accompany fresh avocados, eggs, and homemade tortillas bought in town. But the ever-present seaweed certainly put a damper on our beachcombing, sunbathing, and fishing. The shit reeked and was hell on loose fly line. My attempts at determining the source and identity of the encumbrance on location were futile, and the mystery returned home with me. This was circa 2014, 
and I was working for an outdoor media company that owned multiple entities, including a popular fly fishing magazine. I reached out to the editor with hopes of receiving some insight on the curious seaweed and perhaps an assignment for a story. I included photographs illustrating the severity and prevalence of the stinky grass. Surely, the presence of this foreign plant material on the beaches of one of the most popular fly fishing destinations would be of great interest to his readership. His response surprised me. He answered my query with something along the lines of, I've been fishing the Riviera Maya for 20 years. There's always been seaweed washing up on the beaches. Perhaps the editor was correct. This was some regional natural purging of excess seagrass, the timing of which just so happened to intersect with my vacation. Or perhaps he didn't bother to open the attachment containing photographs depicting work crews raking mounds of seagrass along one of the most popular beaches near Tulum. Maybe I wrote a crappy query. Entirely possible. In casual conversations with other anglers who frequent the Riviera Maya, I didn't gain much support for my budding theory that there was an environmental concern afoot. I'd inquire about the presence of stank grass, as I'd come to call it, and they'd generally respond with, yeah, I saw a little more seaweed than last time, but I hooked five permit in one day, or something of the like. Perhaps we've developed an unfortunate immunity to environmental anomalies. Perhaps I was overreacting. Then I discovered an article in an entirely different fly fishing publication. Essentially, it was the article that I'd pitched several years prior, and I learned that the plant is a free-floating algae known as sargasm. I can only wish that the editor had been facetious back in 2014 when he confidently told me that there was nothing out of the ordinary going on in the Caribbean. Sargasm is a naturally occurring brown macroalgae that floats across the ocean in large island-like masses. The algae originates in the Sargasso Sea, a region of the North Atlantic Ocean bound by four currents, including the mighty Gulf Stream, that form a gyre 1,000 miles wide by 3,000 miles long, roughly the size of the United States. To get a better understanding of the function of the Sargasso Sea, I reached out to Dr. Vincent Encomio, an extension agent in Florida with a PhD in marine science. The Sargasso is an important um floating habitat um, tradition, you know, historically in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, Ocean in an area that we call the Sargasso Sea and it's an important nursery habitat for many many of our um, important commercial fisheries um, and it uh, supports a lot of biodiversity as a result of it being a floating habitat it's really important for it's a it's a refuge habitat for for juve, young baby and juvenile sea turtles, for example. That's where that when they're leaving our beaches, that's where they're swimming out to the to the Sargasso Sea to take refuge uh, in um, in amongst that that floating um, seaweed. Um, so because it's such a significant feature um, in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, it plays an important role in nutrient cycling. Um, uh, taking up excess nutrients in the ocean, also carbon cycling because uh, that uh, all that sargassum is photosynthesizing, so they're taking in carbon dioxide, um, and so so yeah, all of those things. Scientists began to worry that we had too much of a good thing when, around 2011, sargassum began washing up on beaches in previously unseen quantities. That's when scientists discovered that an entirely new population of sargasm had broken off from the Sargasso Sea. We have this uh, cli climate phenomenon in the Atlantic called the North Atlantic Oscillation. And it was in a highly negative phase. Um, so if you, if you look up the North Atlantic Oscillation Index, and I think it's on NOAA's website, they have a record of this pressure sea, sea level pressure oscillation between the Azores and Iceland. And, and so this has been recorded since uh, for over 100 years, uh, this, this, these changes in sea level pressure between these two locations. And it really can determine uh, what weather can be like 
during those particular years. Like it, it, so, well, if, if you were in Florida in 2010 uh, and had been here for a while, uh, you know, a number of years before that, that was a particularly cold winter in in Florida and and as far you know south as where I am in South Florida. And that was sort of a reflection of some of the impact of the effects that uh, the North Atlantic Oscillation can have on our on our seasonal weather, and so it was in a highly negative phase uh, in 2010. And what that meant is that uh, predominant winds from up north were were uh, were further south, and the jet stream was was, was a bit further south, and that. Uh, so those winds associated with that moved a lot of uh, sargassum from the, the center of the Atlantic, which is the Sargasso Sea, and it moved it over to the eastern Atlantic towards Africa. And not too long after that, there were the first reportings of beach sargassum in, on the, the, the western side of, of, of Africa. Um, and, and that had never been observed before, as far as, far as I, as, as, if I recall that correctly. But that amount of sargassum that got moved away from the center of the Atlantic Ocean in the Sargasso Sea, then hooked the ride with some currents that were flowing from north to south. The Canary Current, for example, is, is one of those. And then it, it, that amount of sargassum found its way to around the equatorial zone in the intertropical convergence zone. And if you pay attention to hurricane seasons every year, um, uh, that's, we, we pay attention in Florida and, and the East Coast, Southeast Coast, we, we pay particular attention to that area because that's where a lot of our st- um, hurricanes, or the storms originate that eventually become hurricanes. And that area, it was a new area for sargassum to be established. And, and a couple things that are associated with that um, intertropical convergence zone, uh, there is a sort of consistent supply of water, com- colder water coming up from deeper water to the surface. And that colder water, it, it, that phenomenon is called upwelling. So there's, there's upwelling around that uh, um, equatorial zone, and that colder water typically, colder ocean water typically tends to have higher nutrients. So that was fueling, that was providing more a, a new nutrient source or nutrient source for this new sargassum that sort of made its way into this area where it had, where it had not been observed before. Okay, what I'm gathering from Dr. Incamio is that a weather pattern in 2010 caused a patch of the Sargasso Sea to drift away, spawning a whole new patch of algae that begins to thrive in ideal ocean conditions. Essentially, a second Sargasso Sea now exists in the Atlantic. And that established a new population of sargassum outside of the Sargasso Sea, such Mm. to the point where it became it became a very significant feature in that area stretching all the way from western africa all the way into the caribbean and now it's recognized by scientists as the great atlantic sargassum belt and it is the largest uh macroalgae or um, seaweed bloom in the world so it's it's over 5000 miles from western africa to the Caribbean and even in, uh, can stretch a little bit into the Gulf of Mexico as well. The surge in sargasm also has a direct impact on fish and other wildlife. For example, the buildup of sargasm mats impedes adult sea turtles from accessing nesting beaches. In turn, hatchlings struggle to navigate the blockade and become easy pickings for predators. Marine mammals can also become entangled in the mats and drown. In short, Natural fish nurseries, such as mangroves and seagrass meadows, have been reported to be negatively impacted by sargassum. While we certainly don't understand all of the impacts that elevated sargassum levels have on the environment, 
we are likely contributing to the problem on an entirely different continent. The data points to an interconnected quandary of increased agriculture and human activity in South America, which pumps more deposits into our ocean's largest tributary, the Amazon River. So the Amazon Basin runoff uh, is, can, is, thought, is hypothesized to be a factor as well, probably providing more nutrients for this, this great Atlantic Sargassum Belt. Um, so it's certainly not helping the situation. It's probably making it. It's probably making it, uh, you know, a bit worse. But that um, climate anomaly, uh, that anomalous North Atlantic Oscillation Index that happened in 2010 or recorded in 2010, is what got the sargassum in that area to begin with. Of course, this is a fishing podcast. And the areas of concern are among the most popular saltwater fly fishing destinations on Earth. So we reached out to some snowbirds for first-hand perspective. Aaron Fox is a Montana-based guide who spends much of the winter DIY fishing in the Riviera Maya. Um, definitely noticed it the first first time going down there, and um, you know, some of the undeveloped beaches. It just overtakes the beaches, and uh, it was like. Yeah, a little shocking, like you said, to see the first time, and uh, a little smelly. And you know, if it's a if it's a developed beach, then they've got guys, you know, constantly raking and cleaning the beaches, and uh, kind of gets get getting worse over the years. It seems for sure. Uh, but yeah, there's definitely times where like certain tides or certain w- winds, you wake up in one of the flats you want to go to. There's 15 feet as Sarah that gasm that you gotta walk through to get out and it's covering up a lot of the good bonefish water. Like on the you know, the flat the shallow insides, you know. And how has this new environment changed the game for fly anglers in the Riviera Mile? Not that it's a positive note, but I ran into Pete down there. He was staying at one of the lodges in Ishclack and do they get these Saragasso crabs? that are like floating crabs that feed in that. And his first day out with the guide, they've picked off a big permit on a dry, like sipper, floating crab. So that's become a thing down there. People are catching some permit on floating, what they call a Saragasso crab. It's a, if you Google Saragasso crab, they're a foam dry fly. Across the Caribbean, the shallow waters surrounding the islands of the Bahamas are legendary amongst fly anglers. Soft white beaches stretch to the horizon. At least, that's how it's supposed to be. So the first, the first time I noticed it was fairly recently. I would say, probably three years ago, there was a there was a, a buildup, and it wasn't enough to stop me from fishing, but it was it surprised me because it was the first time in all my years that I had seen it. Um, I was able to sort of wade through it and, and get out to my areas and. Um, it didn't it, the first year it wasn't an issue but every year after that it was so thick and so prevalent it's such a big patch that i you know i'd sort of poke my head look and just turn around and leave that's dave cook owner of skinny waters fly fishing a montana-based travel company specializing in diy and semi-guided excursions to flats fishing destinations in africa the bahamas mexico and christmas island Cook has the perspective of someone who has seen this issue develop over many years of traveling to the islands of the Bahamas. Like Fox, Cook sees the sargasm as a hindrance that alters the shallow water environment that has lured sight fishing fanatics to the Bahamas for decades. Yeah, you know, I was just in the Bahamas in, I was in November. Um, and no, I'm sorry, I take it back. I was there over Christmas, I was in there in December. And it, there was more sargasm at my spot this year than I had ever seen, and it was it was by far it wasn't it wasn't a little it was it was monstrous the area that was that was just socked in I mean just thick with it. Typically, March begins the official start of sargasm season, with the peak during the summer months. But this year, the seaweed showed up early and often along the beaches of the Riviera Maya from Cancun to Belize and in Florida and the Bahamas. This January, 2023, has already set a record for all previous January months. 
Worse, the amount of sargasm waiting offshore at this time of year is four times that of normal. Satellite data reveals blooms stretching from Africa to the Amazon, then up the coast of Florida. The scientists at UC, uh, not UC, USF, University of South Florida in Tampa, um, they've developed, they, they watch this pretty closely, and they actually develop a forecast, um, uh, and they, they, they provide uh, updates every month on the, the, the outlook for um, sargassum. And the, it's this most recent report in January of 2023 that's sort of gotten news alerted, the news agencies alerted to, to this coming year. Um, so in the, the last really bad year of sargassum was 2018. There was about, what they're saying here in this report is in January, it was a January record in 2018, they estimated about 6.5 million tons of sargassum in the Atlantic Ocean, you know, this great sargassum belt. This year, uh, from from December to January, uh, December 2022 to January 2023, they're estimating 8.7 million tons. So it's about a 30% increase. So so it's breaking the record of uh, for this time of year um, for the amount of sargassum that they're seeing. So so the outlook. Um, for this coming spring and summer is, uh, you know, people are a little concerned. Sargasm growth has spawned a whole new industry aimed at tackling the problem. In Cancun, environmental authorities plan to partner with a new private firm that is said to process up to 600 tons of sargasm seaweed per day. In theory, this biomass can then be converted into fuels, other products, or used as fertilizer. However, there's a hitch. The complication, you know, uh, with sargassum, and it, it sort of was the main question we were trying to address when we did our composting project, is sargassum naturally accumulates arsenic from the environment. Um, mm. a, lot of, a lot of seaweeds accumulate metals. Um, it's the nature of their cell walls that attract um, ions that are positively charged like, like metals. And in the case of sargassum, um, the two sargassum species that, we, that predominate these blooms, it's, it's, it's arsenic. So we have to really be careful about the messaging with regards to, say, use of compost. You know, so right now, um, we're not recommending and FIU as well, the, the FIU study is, is not recommending that they use um, sargassum-based compost for growing edible um, edible plants, you know, vegetables and, and, and things like that. So um, it's probably okay for general landscaping, um, but that's kind of where we're at with that. And, um, and one of the things that I'm working on currently is uh, with some scientists at FIT, uh, Florida Institute of Technology, is trying to see if we can also convert that sargassum into biochar, which is a, a, a really highly refined charcoal, kind of think activated charcoal. And um, it has a, a number of different applications for um, soil amendment, you know, uh, sequestering nutrients and water and, and um, um, retaining water in soils and, and, it, and as a filtration uh, make, um, substrate as well. So we're actually, uh, that's one beneficial use that we're, that we're trying to work on that will hopefully find another potentially beneficial use for all this excess sargassum. Undeveloped beaches continue to amass piles of the stinky seaweed but floating barriers are being deployed throughout the Caribbean. Um, there is a, there have been companies um, that have developed technology to stop it before it reaches the shore. There's a, an organization called the, the Ocean Cleaner, and they have like a boom system, and they're trying to harvest it, harvest it offshore before it reaches the, um, the beaches, say, in the Caribbean. But it's... Um, yeah, the amounts might be, it's still a lot to deal with. 
So it's still, it's still definitely a problem. For instance, a 1,400 meter long anti-seaweed barrier was recently placed in Mahual, Mexico, one of the most affected areas. Don't cancel your spring break plans just yet, but be aware that sargasm may be there to greet you in Mexico, Florida, and the Bahamas. This environmental concern is forecasted to only get worse and is yet another example of our changing planet and the role that human activity plays. There's no sense in denying that massive pile of rotting algae in front of your favorite beach in Playa del Carmen. Thank you for tuning into the February Room podcast. If you would like to support our efforts in continuing to create awesome content, go to patreon.com forward slash the February Room. And remember to like, share, and subscribe.